श्री राधा नटवर की जय श्री श्री जगन्नाथ बलदेव सुभद्रा की जय श्री श्री गौनताय की जय श्री श्री गिरी गोवधान की जय शिल प्रभुपाद की जय समवेत भक्त बिंद की जय लिताय गौर प्रेमानंदी हरि हरि गो यू आर गुड मे थैंक यू थैंक यू ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय 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 हरे कृष्णा सो इट्स सो नाइस टू बी हियर आम आई recognize a few of the devotees who've been here for a long time uh, i think our last visit to columbus was maybe 11 years ago something like that um before i was married and before i had kids and all of that and it's um i had just gotten my first uh, teaching position my first full time teaching position at uh, center college in kentucky uh, about a 4 hour drive south and this was the closest temple uh, that um we had and so we'd uh, come up here and uh, i i'd come up here over the weekend and and um uh, uh prem vilas prabhu and lalita mata ji were such wonderful hosts i think at that time he was piyush prabhu and um they would uh, uh, give us lots of prasadam for the next week <laughs> i would pile up as much food as i could and take it back and uh so it was uh, my columbus was my lifeline uh, during the first year uh before i got married and then i got married uh after that and and uh and then things became more uh, smooth and balanced in my life but at that point the first year living in kentucky after pretty much living my whole life in the association of devotees it was a big challenge and columbus temple was kind of the lifeline uh, for association so it's so nice to be back here uh with all of you uh, f- uh familiar faces and new faces as well uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to say a few words about bhagavad gita uh so i wanted to read actually today um uh, one of my favorite verses from bhagavad gita this is a verse i've loved over many many years and and um uh, thought uh, a lot about and so i thought i would um read this verse and and then uh, have a discussion with all of you to see Uh, your thoughts on this particular verse i uh, ask you a few questions about it uh, and then um say a few words of my own okay so uh let's see maybe a uh, few people may know this verse so if you want you can repeat we won't do it many times just a couple of times so uh, here it goes mattah parataram nanya mattah parataram nanya किंचिदस्ति धनंजय किंचिदस्ति धनंजय मयि सर्वं मिदं प्रोतं मयि सर्वं मिदं प्रोतं सूत्रे मणिगणायव सूत्रे मणिगणायव मत्तः परतरं नान्य मत्तः परतरं नान्य किंचिदस्ति धनंजय किंचिदस्ति धनंजय मयि सर्वं मिदं प्रोतं मयि सर्वं मिदं सूत्रे सूत्रे मत्तः परतरं नान्य किंचिदस्ति धनंजय मयि सर्वं मिदं प्रोतं सूत्रे Translation purpose by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhu Pad. O conqueror of wealth, Krishna is speaking to Arjun. O conqueror of wealth, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me, as pearls are strung on a thread. Please repeat. O conqueror of wealth. O conqueror of wealth. There is no truth superior to me. There is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me. Everything rests upon me. As pearls are strung on a thread. As pearls are strung on a thread. Purport. There is a common controversy over whether the supreme absolute truth is personal or impersonal. As far as the Bhagavad Gita is concerned, the absolute truth is the personality of Godhead Shri Krishna. 
And this is confirmed in every step. In this verse in particular, it is stressed that the absolute truth is a person. That the personality of God it is the supreme absolute truth is also the affirmation of the Brahma Samhita. Ishvara Paramaha Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha. That is, the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead is Lord Krishna, who is the primeval Lord, the reservoir of all pleasure, Govinda, and the eternal form of complete bliss and knowledge. These authorities leave no doubt that the absolute truth is the supreme person, the cause of all causes. The impersonalist, however, argues on the strength of the Vedic version given in the Shvetashvatara Upanishad. Tato yad uttarataram tadarupam manamayam yadetad viduram ritaste bhavanti athetare dukkham eva piyanti. In the material world, Brahma, the primeval living entity within the universe, is understood to be the supreme amongst the demigods, human beings, and lower animals. But beyond Brahma, there is the transcendence who has no material form and is free from all material contaminations. Anyone who can know him also becomes transcendental, but those who do not know him suffer the miseries of the material world. The impersonalist puts more stress on the word arupam, but this arupam is not impersonal. It indicates the transcendental form of eternity, bliss and knowledge as described in the Brahma Samhita quoted above. Other verses in the Shvetashvatara Upanishad substantiate this as follows. Vedahametam purusham mahantam aditya varnam tamasa parastat tameva viditvati mrityumeti nanya pantha vidyate yanaya yasmat paramna paramasti kinchid yasmanani yuno jayosti kinchid vriksha ivas tabdho divitishtatyekas I know that Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is transcendental to all material conceptions of darkness. Only he who knows him can transcend the bonds of birth and death. There is no way for liberation other than this knowledge of that Supreme Person. There is no truth superior to that Supreme Person, because he is the supermost. He is smaller than the smallest, and he is greater than the greatest. He is situated as a silent tree, and he illuminates, illumines the transcendental sky as a tree spreads its roots. He spreads his extensive energies. From these verses, one concludes that the supreme absolute truth is the supreme personality of Godhead, who is all-pervading by his multi-energies, both material and spiritual. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjana Shalaka Chakshurun Miritam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha So Krishna is saying once more the translation, O conqueror of wealth, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. So this uh, analogy, this metaphor is what I wanted to meditate on a little bit, which is uh, Krishna is describing uh, this world and himself. He's saying, there's nothing in this world superior to me. And as soon as you hear that statement, one might expect Krishna to say, I'm the highest in the sky and everyone is down below me, or I'm the biggest, or whatever. But Krishna, to illustrate this point, that there is no truth superior to me, mattaha parataram nanya, there's no truth parataram, higher than I am. He doesn't give an analogy of bigness or highness or like that, but rather gives a very intimate, very sweet example. He says, Sutre Manigana Iva, like a row of pearls or jewels upon a thread. Everything rests upon me, like pearls rest upon a thread. Uh, so, first of all, I, I want us to notice how. Um, how unexpected this example is, right? how unexpected, because Krishna's first statement is one of power and glory and majesty. Mattaha parataram nanyat kinchit asti. This is like strong language in Sanskrit. Mattaha than me, paratara, higher, parataram, matta parataram na anyat. There is no other. In case there is any doubt in the, in the mind, Krishna adds the word kinchit, kinchidasti. This is not necessary. Matta parataram nanyat would be sufficient. 
But kinchit means even a little bit, right? Even something, just even a little small something is not higher than me. Kinchidasti dhananjaya. And at this point you think, wow, majesty, power, glory. This is the glory of God, right? And he must be up there with a thunderbolt ready to kill us all. Right? And yet, then the analogy shows up and it's so sweet, it's so intimate, it's so close. Krishna is saying, everything rests upon me like pearls upon a thread. And so Krishna really surprises because, uh, you know, there's two sides to Krishna's nature. Uh, uh, the Lord's nature is one of Aishwarya, of great power and su supremacy. This is called Paratva, the Lord's supremacy. That's the first line of the verse, Parataram, Paratva, the Lord's supremacy. But then there's also another aspect of the Lord, which is his Solabhya, or his Madhurya, his accessibility. Uh, his sweetness. And both of these have to go very closely together. If Krishna, if God was just uh, majestic, was just powerful and supreme, <coughs> then it would be someone you would bow down in front of. But how would you actually approach such a person? Right? What use would that person be to you if they are not accessible? Isn't it? I mean, if someone is, is totally great and powerful and majestic in every way, and all you can do is tremble in front of them, then, okay, you'll bow, but how is that person going to be helpful to you? Because they can't actually, you can't actually talk to them. They're so frightening. On the other hand, if God was only uh, solabhya, only easily accessible, like you and me, then why would we want to worship him? He has to be great, right? Otherwise, you can worship anything. You can worship you, me, every, anyone, right? But he has to be paratva. He has to be supreme. So the Lord's transcendence, in English it's called transcendence and immanence uh, in theology. His supremacy and his accessibility. Both of those things have to go very closely together. Uh, they have to be tied. Otherwise, the Lord is not complete. His Aishwarya and his Madhurya. The two are inseparable both aspects. And this verse is a beautiful example of that. Because Krishna is in the first line making in no uncertain terms his position as the Supreme. There's no truth superior to me. Everyone is less than me. But lest we feel that this makes the Lord inaccessible and frightening and, and unapproachable, in the next line he says, but actually Everything is resti resting upon me like pearls upon a thread. In other words, the pearls in this case is what? In this analogy, what is the pearls? Us, material energy. Us, yes, us, the material world, everything we see around us, but especially us. And he is the thread that runs through them. How close, how intimate is that? You can't get any closer than that. Right? He runs right through us. Not above us, not below us, not on the side. He's right through us. Now, let's think about this for a couple of minutes. Uh, in what ways, in what ways, I want your help here, in what ways are we like pearls? How would you... Uh, how would you, how, how does this comparison work? How does it hold? In what way are we like pearls or gems in this example? Anyone? Unsure, unsure of the Lord. Yeah, so we're parts, right? We're parts of the entire necklace. We hang upon the thread uh, uh, as uh, the pearls. We're also parts of Krishna. Very good. What else? We're in association with we're connected to each other, right? The pearls on a necklace that's well made are going to be touching each other, right? Uh, there's close contact and relationship between each one. Uh, and so the connection is not just with the thread, but also with our joint connection in on that thread uh, as part of that same necklace, right? Very good. It takes a lot of 
lot of work to get from the oyster to the coal, which is the pearl. Yes, yes. So the pearls are valuable and rare objects. Krishna is not saying all of you are pieces of dirt on a, on a, on a thali or something, right? He, he, he could. He's big, right? We're small. Uh, in front of him, who are we, right? But Krishna, he's being very kind here, very generous, right? He's saying, you're like pearls. And pearls, as you mentioned, are difficult to get. They're rare. Why? Because they're difficult to get. Found deep within the oyster, created at the bottom of the sea. Uh, and they're beautiful. They're valuable. Which means everyone, everyone has value in Krishna's eyes. That there's no one who thinks uh, that, who, f who can say, oh, I've got no value. Mm -hmm. If you look at a necklace, mm -hmm. that every part of that necklace is crucial to that necklace looking nice, looking beautiful. Right? I'm trying to look for a necklace, but everyone is <laughs> such simple devotees here. No one has <laughs> necklaces. <laughs> we can look at the deities. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, it's an excellent point. You're jumping ahead, actually. So we'll, <laughs> we'll get to the third. In, uh, we'll hold on to that thought, because we're going to get to the thread in a minute. Okay? So I just want to focus on the pearls for a second. So we came up with some very important points. Yeah. Right? The pearl is valuable. It's rare. It's, uh, it's part of the whole thing. It's connected with each other, as well as the thread. Right? Uh, Quality in same as Krishna. Living yes. So how does the pearl and the thread? What are you talking about? Yeah, the, the analogy. See, the, the pearls, the, the main thing is that the pearls are part, right, of the whole thing. So in that way, the pearls are the necklace, yes? But at the same time, they have their individual distinctiveness. This is achintya bheda bheda in technical terms, right? So you're part of the, of the whole necklace. Uh, so you have unity. Everyone in this world is unified. Uh, this is the other point, right? We're all, like, we're connected with each other, as you said. But all of us are part of the same necklace. Uh, Krishna is not saying that, oh, uh, some of you are part of, are resting upon me as pearls on a thread. And others, I just kind of left them out, <laughs> right? Uh, I threw them away. I scattered them. He's not saying that. He's not excluding anyone. He says elsewhere in Bhagavad Gita, he says, everyone is on my path. Mama vartmanu vartante manushya partha sarvashaha. He says, everyone is on my path. Sarvashaha. Not that some people are off my path. Some people I've rejected. Some people I've forgotten forever in hell. No. He's saying, everyone's on my path. Now, some people may be further ahead. Some people may be behind on the path. So there's differences, right? But everyone is there together in the same necklace we're all connected together all unified and yet even though we're unified we're distinct right? we're distinct every individual has its own quality and its own value just like if you look at a well-made necklace some necklaces every pearl is the same right but in many it's different some pearls are smaller some are bigger some are different colors, and all together, their value is so much greater than one on its own. A pink jewel looks really nice, and a white jewel looks really nice. But you put the pink next to the white, and it's something different, right? It's beautiful, it's amazing. It has its own color and complexion. In the same way, each one of us in this world has distinctive value. We have a unique quality, a unique place in Krishna's necklace that's meant to decorate him. And no one can take our place in that necklace. That role we serve, just like everyone in the spiritual world in Golok Vrindavan, everyone has a special role to play. Like in that picture there, Krishna, this is a very beautiful picture. It's actually one of my favorite uh, paintings from the BBT. This is Krishna and Balaram, right, dancing or, or running in the forest, frolicking. 
and you can see the joy in their faces. Everyone is so free and happy and joyful, right? And you see the long line of coward boys. Now, it's like a necklace, no? The long line of coward boys and all the cows and the different colors, see? Some of the cows are dark blue and some are white and some of the boys are dark in color and some are light in color and some are uh, uh, older and some are younger. Everyone has their unique feature in that long line. And it's not that the ones in the back are left out. This is the nature of the material world. That if you're in a long line and you're in the back, then you're less important. And the ones in the front are the most important. Just like when the president gets inaugurated, then the most important people get to sit right around him, right? And then the average person is way out in the National Mall, way on the opposite side. But this is not like that in the spiritual world. Every coward boy has a place on that necklace, is distinctive and is unique, and has a role to play in Krishna's Leela that no one else can fill. And when that coward boy is absent, Krishna feels, where did he go? He notices uh, and he feels it. So that when we return to the spiritual world, then Krishna welcomes us like a long lost friend and says, where were you? We didn't have anyone to play this part in our game. Uh, Your spot was empty. It was so difficult to be here without you. Krishna says that to the devotee. He welcomes him. This is described in Brihad Bhagavatamrita when Gopakumar returns to the spiritual world. That embrace of Krishna is saying, look, I have this necklace and there's an empty spot here. Doesn't it look bad when if there's a missing bead in a necklace? It's difficult to wear that necklace because there's a spot missing in it. Right? And Krishna's necklace is the same way. Uh, he says, you're each distinct. You've got a spot. And where have you been? Right? Where have you been? The other thing we learn from the pearls is that e- each one is so small on its own compared to the whole necklace. Uh, if you think about it, our role in this world, our place in Krishna's creation, on one level is so tiny, is so tiny. Uh, uh, if, you, if you think about the extent of this creation, uh, just recently Sumit Prabhu was telling me that this uh, astronomers have discovered a whole new cluster of galaxies. Now, you know what that means, a cluster of galaxies? This is like hundreds, thousands of galaxies put together thousands of light years away. And in every galaxy, there are billions and billions of stars. And each one of those stars is like a sun with so many planets and solar systems and asteroids running around it. And in each one of those is like a planet with as much or more space than this planet Earth. Our planet is actually one of the smallest in the solar system. So, so tiny. And in this world, you think about it. Please try again. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we should restart the class on that note. <laughs> so, so we have to. So if you think of this world, so big it is, right? It took us from Utah. It takes us eight hours to fly here to come on and on and on, endless land, and it's just a small part of this world. And then we land in Columbus and it's on and on and on. It's such a big city. And highways and this highway and 670 and 70 and 71 and 76. They're all so many people. And each one, there's each location, so many hundreds of people are living. And each person has a house and the house is so big and it's so beautiful. And two or three cars. And in that little house, there's one person who is living in that house, thinking, I am the king of the world. (laughs) There's no truth superior to me. How foolish it looks from Krishna's perspective, right? When every little pearl on that necklace says, I am the necklace, I'm the biggest, I'm the most important here. And Krishna's saying, no, you are so important because you have a place on this necklace. But I'm the thread, not you, right? I'm the center of this. From Krishna's perspective, this is just one universe. All these galaxies and stars and planets, one universe. 
And there are millions of universes like this, multiverses. And all of them, when Lord Mahavishnu breathes in, and he breathes out, and he breathes in, and the whole thing is finished. Everything, just like that. And he breathes out, and they all come out like water vapor from someone's breath. You know, on a cold day, you see that water vapor? Like those droplets, each universe comes out. That is the greatness of God. Prabhupada used to say, we all say that God is great, but we don't know how great he is. It means that's what we call greatness, not like what we think is great. And even if someone's so rich and so powerful, they may be the most powerful person in this world. What is their greatness compared to the multiple planets and multiple stars and multiple galaxies and multiple universes? Who are they compared to the Lord? This is what he says, means when he says, Mattaha parataram nanyat. There is no truth superior to me. Kinchit, even in little. And yet, the beauty of Krishna's statement is that despite us being so small and so tiny, that he could just very easily crush us like a grain of sand, he's still saying, no, you're a pearl. You're a pearl and you are as valuable to me as a missing pearl on a necklace. I may have the world's most valuable necklace, but one missing pearl makes that necklace worthless. You cannot wear it. Everyone will look at it and say it's broken. That's how much value Krishna is giving us. That's his beauty. And the, the response of the devotee to this is a deep sense of humility. A devotee looks at this and says, wow, on the one hand, I'm so small, I'm so tiny, that why should Krishna even notice me? A devotee feels, I'm so small. Right? That sense of genuine humility comes into to the mind of the devotee. On, on the other side, the devotee thinks, Wow, Krishna is so merciful that even though I'm so small, he's so kind. And he takes, gives me so much personal attention. And he gives me so much care. Not only that, he stays with me. And this brings us to the second part of the analogy, which is the thread. In what way is Krishna like the thread? We've been talking about the pearls. But in what way is Krishna like the thread? Anyone? He's supporting, he's sustaining. He's holding everything up like the thread, holds up all the pearls. Good. What else? How else is Krishna like the thread? We cannot see the thread. Yes. So this is a very important point, right? That what is the sign of a well-made necklace? You can't see the thread. If you have a necklace where all the beads are starting to move around, and you're starting to see the thread, then something's going wrong with the necklace, right? Not such a good necklace anymore. The sign of a well-made necklace is that you cannot see the thread, isn't it? And so the nature of this world is such that people look and look and look for God everywhere, but he has built it in such a fine way that even after looking and looking and looking, they cannot find him. Right? What does Krishna says, say in Gita? Vedaham samatitani vartamanani charjuna bhavishyani chabhutani maam tu vedana krashchana. Krishna says, he says, Vedaham samatitani, I know the past, atita, vartamanani charjuna, I know the present, bhavishyani, I know the future, Chabhutani, and I know all of the pearls, all the living entities. I know them very well. But Mam Tu Veda Nakashchana, but no one knows me. And the pearls, what's so funny is that the pearls all look at each other and go, You have a thread? No, I don't see a thread. Where's a thread? <laughs> I, these religious people tell, tell us we're all, there's a thread somewhere, but I don't see a thread. Do you? And everyone, each pearl looks at the thread. And they go, I, I don't see one. Right? 
And so Prabhupada says, you can look and look all you want. You can dig deep into the atom. You can go high into the sky and nowhere will you find God. Because he cannot be found like that. Nayam atma pravachanena labhya. Namedhaya na bahuna shrutena. You Krishna says, you cannot, Upanishads, they say, you cannot know the Lord by great lectures, by a lot of study in books and PhDs. and so You cannot know that. Know the Lord like this. You can only know Him. Vivirnute tanum swam. Only when He chooses to reveal Himself to us. Only then we can know Him. By His own choice, by His own mercy. When He decides that we are qualified to know Him. We are worth uh, revealing Himself to us. Uh, so, this is why the Vedanta Sutra says, Tarko Pratishthanat, that the Lord can never be proven by any amount of logic and argument. You know, people have been trying to prove the existence of God since the beginning of philosophy. If you study the philosophy of religion, both in Western philosophy and in Eastern philosophy, people have been trying to prove the existence of God through logical means. And no proof has been satisfactory. And the Vedanta Sutra says right up front, it says, you're not going to do it. It's not possible. Tarko Pratishthanat. Why? Because if you could prove the existence of God, if you could wrap your head around God, then it means your brain is greater than God's. Right? Means if I say, prove how computers work, someone in this audience can do it. Right? You can show me, you can, I don't know how, but you can show me and un, un, take it apart and show me every component and explain all the properties. Why? Because you're greater than the computer. And I'm greater than the computer, therefore I can understand. If we could do that with God, take apart his components and prove his existence and explain his nature just by our brain, it means what? We are God. We're greater than God. And Krishna has just precluded that possibility. Mattaha parataram nanyat. So our physical bodies can't reach God, but our brains can't reach him either. We cannot. It's reasonable to believe in God. We can show that, that oh, every reasonable person should believe in God. But the absolute proof, mm -mm. Krishna, he's uh, the thread that is completely hidden within the pearls and is available, is knowable only to those who have a little bit of sense, right? A little bit of knowledge, a little bit of common sense. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada, mm -hmm. Prabhupada, he often used to say, he says, anyone with a little bit of brain substance, will understand <laughs> the existence of God, right? Prabhupada had a very sweet way of talking like that. Say, so anyone with a little bit of brain substance, right, would understand the existence of God. He's, he's there, right? Uh, it's reasonable. Yes? So one can infer that there, there is a thread in a pearl necklace because the, the necklace is together. Yes, yes. So then isn't that, isn't that a logical inference? Yes, it's a logical inference, but it's, the, the point is that it's not an absolute proof, right? It's not an absolute proof. In other words, the pearls might be stuck to each other using glue, right? Uh, so this, this, this is the thing. This is the thing about the world is that if someone does not want to believe in God, Krishna has made this world so beautifully and so perfectly that you can find a non-God explanation for everything, right? It's, it's, like, it's, like someone who, it's like someone sleeping, right? If someone is sleeping, you can shake them and wake them up. And if they don't wake up, pour cold water on them, then they wake up. But if someone is pretending to sleep, you can pour cold water and sound a horn in their ear and they still won't wake up because they're pretending, right? In the same way, if someone wants to deny the reasonability of believing in God, the world is designed so perfectly, right? Everything happens perfectly, like clockwork. The sun rises and sets. The eclipse happened, right? So every, everyone could time it to the second, to the millisecond. In every part, this percentage of the sun will be visible or not. Right? That kind of precision, it's only reasonable to believe that someone made it, right? I mean, it's like finding a watch in the desert, right? You, you're walking in the Sahara Desert and you find this watch in the, in the sand. Are you going to pick it up and go, geez, wow, that's an amazing coalition of chance and particles. How did they all come together and make, how did the dust come together and make this? 
No. What are you going to think? So, someone was here before me, right? They lost a watch. There's maybe people in the desert, right? That's how you're going to think. So it's reasonable to look at the clockwork of the sun and the moon, the movement of the tides, the growth of seasons and spring and fall and winter, to look at the beauty and precision of every cell in the human body and the amount of care and attention that's given to it and go, there's clearly a clockmaker here somewhere. There's, where's the watchmaker? There must have been someone here before me. That's reasonable. But if we want to deny the reasonability, there's always an explanation, right? Krishna has made this world just so we can forget him, because, and so we can remember him. But it's specific facility for those who want to forget Krishna. So Krishna makes it so nicely that we can find some explanation, right? behind it. Oh, it must be like this. Must be. Maybe the, the pearls are glued together. Maybe they're all magnetic. Maybe, you know, anything but believing in the thread, right? Because I can't handle the fact that I am supported by someone else. Right? Yes? <laughs> but about the watch, because we have seen that humans have made watches. Yes. That is why we conclude that but with this universe, uh, we have not seen anybody who has made such a big universe. So that's why we cannot, uh, so that argument that, that yes. because I see a watch, there must be a person yes. or, or somebody. But it is uh, Pro, yes, so Prabhupada gives a very nice explanation. The, uh, Prabhu's point is that we can't see who, we don't have any example of seeing who made the universe, right? Just like we know human beings make watches, but we don't have. But Prabhupada gives a very nice point in this regard. He says, simple point, he says, life comes from life. Forget the universe, just look at life itself. And what is our experience? One living thing comes from another living thing. Right? And so that we have seen in experience. And so even if you don't want to believe in God, fine. But there has to be a living force somewhere at the beginning. Right? Uh, uh, the philosopher Aristotle, uh, uh, Greek philosopher, he said, there must be an unmoved mover. He said, everything in this world is moving. And we know from experience that movement is caused by something else in motion, right? Because otherwise anything in rest is going to stay at rest, right? So there must have been someone else who moved it. And that thing that moves this thing, it must have been moved by something else. And that must have been moved by something else. What is that thing, he says, at the beginning of this creation, which has moved everything, the first thing, and yet is not moved himself? The cause of all causes, yes. Ishwara Parama Krishna Sachidananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarvakarana Karana. Anadir Adir. He's Adi. He is the origin, but he's Anadi. He has no origin himself. That is the unmoved mover. So this thread, right? It's a well-made necklace. It means Krishna has made it so nicely that we can forget him if we want. And yet, if we see Krishna, if we know that Krishna is there, then we will see him in everything. This is the beauty of the thread and the pearls. Is there one pearl on that necklace which does not have a thread running through it? No. Right? In other words, for one who wants to deny the Lord, he's nowhere. The necklace has no thread. But for one who knows that the thread exists, in every pearl, he can see the thread. Every pearl. And this is the vision of the devotee. The devotee looks around, and in everything, he sees Krishna. Everything. He looks at the ocean, and Krishna says what? Of bodies of water, I am the ocean. He looks at the seasons, and he thinks, oh, Krishna says of seasons, I am the flower-bearing spring. He looks at a dangerous shark, and Krishna says of... Uh, uh, aquatics, I am the shark. In every human being, he looks and he sees the living entity and he sees the Paramatma, the super soul within the heart. Also, one other thing that yes. The thread is aware of all the pearls on it. Yes. But the pearl at this end of the necklace, if it's a long necklace, is not aware of the pearl. Yes. Like the super consciousness or the supreme consciousness. Yes. Is aware of all the yes. Exactly. So, very nice point. Huh? 
that the thread is conscious of, present within, feeling every single pearl. But not all the pearls are aware of every other pearl. Right? This is the difference between the pearl and the thread. This is the difference between us and Krishna. Uh, think about this. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita in chapter 4, right? he says, uh, I, in the beginning, I gave this knowledge to the sun god, Vivaswan, much before you. And Arjun comes back to Krishna and he says, how is this possible? You and I are the same age. Uh, and so you gave this knowledge millions of years ago to the sun god? Mm. Krishna, what is his answer? He says, many, many births, both you and I have passed. But the difference, you've taken many births and I've taken many births. The difference, I can remember all of them, but you cannot. In, again, in chapter 13 of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that you are aware of individual bodies, kshetra, but I, he says, sarva kshetreshu bharata, I am aware of every body. Why? Because like a thread, he's in the core of our hearts. He's deep, deep within our heart. And he knows us as individuals better than anyone else can know us. Better than we can even know ourselves. He knows us. He says, Ishwara Sarvabhutanam Rideshe Arjuna Tishtati Brahmayan Sarvabhutani Yantra Rudhani Mayaya. He says, I am in the core of the hearts of every living entity, and I am directing, directing their wanderings. Brahmayan Sarvabhutani. I'm guiding them where they should go. From me come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Sarvasichaham ridisin sannivishto. Matta smritir jnanam apohanam cha. So he's there, right there in the core of our hearts. Uh, and and he's, he's guiding us, he's moving us. Not just human beings, every species Krishna is guiding. Uh, he's directing them. Uh, you know, uh, these birds, they migrate from Canada all the way to Mexico. Uh, every fall they make this journey down to Mexico and every spring they make the journey back up to Canada. Not one bird gets lost along the way. Everyone knows where they're going. And you know what's more amazing? Is they stop in the same places every year. Forget birds, even butterflies. You know there's a type of butterfly, I think they're the monarch butterflies. There's these butterflies that migrate from Canada to Mexico. Thousands of miles, they're migrating. And you can go par to parts of California, and in a particular season, you go outside, you drive past, and you see that the colors on the leaves have all changed. But it's not because of the fall. It's because what you're thinking are leaves are actually the entire trees are covered with millions and millions of these little butterflies. Every butterfly knows where to go. I mean, can you and I do a journey of a thousand miles without GPS? <laughs> Forget it, right? Without a map, right? We can't. And yet somehow these little butterflies who are supposed to be so much less intelligent than we are, and yet they're able to make a thousand mile journey, they know where to stop, they know how to use the currents of wind that pass, they know which direction they're going, they know their rest areas, no signs along the way, rest area here, stop here, none. And yet they know, right? they know exactly what to do. Why? Because Krishna's the thread, Krishna's the super soul within their heart, Brahmayan Sarvabhut, and he's directing their wanderings, guiding them which way they need to go, telling them what is good for them and what is not good for them. Hmm. Uh, you had a point? Yeah. So earlier you said that if you are not on spiritual path, you are, it's like missing a thread. But the way I see it, like there's, there can be nothing, up. you can't be a missing part of the thread. Even if you are not on the spiritual path, you are doing your role. Yes. So it's like you cannot be a missing piece of the yes. thread. You have 
it's only whether you are up. Yes, that's, that's an excellent point and it leads just to the next point I was going to make. I couldn't have paid you for that. It was very good, <laughs> very important. So ultimately the point is that we're actually not missing. You're right, we're actually not missing from that thread. Right? No one is missing, no one is lost for the Lord. Why? Because he's right there in the heart. Right? We may be lost. Sometimes we feel lost. Where am I? My GPS stopped. Right? And then we don't know. But Krishna never loses us. Because wherever we go, Krishna is right there in the heart. It's not that the pearl is missing. It's just that Krishna is waiting for the pearl to acknowledge the thread. For the pearl to say, yes, I recognize the fact that I am supported by you that I depend on you, that you are my shelter. That's all. Uh, Krishna's waiting for us to recognize that he's there in the heart with us, lifetime after lifetime. We were all monarch butterflies at one point, you know? Prabhupada says, scriptures say, we've been through all the different species, every single one of the 8,400,000 different thousand types of different forms of life, we've been through them. We've been Brahma, we've been the butterfly, we've been the ant. We've been through each one of those species and in each one of those lives, Krishna has stayed with us as the super soul next to us, as the thread, keeping us alive and supporting us and helping us. But he's waiting. He's waiting for us to recognize him, to give up this false idea. Oh yeah, it's just us. There's no thread. Right? And to understand, no, we depend entirely on him. And without him, we would be nothing. Right? If you cut the necklace, if you snip it, then the, the thread, you cut it, what happens? All, I don't know if you've had that experience of a necklace breaking on you. It goes everywhere. Right? And each pearl is still valuable, but it's lost. Right? It's, what are you going to do? It's, you're going to put it in your palm and that's it. You can't hang it somewhere, you can't decorate yourself. The pearls without a necklace, they're lost. They're empty. And so Krishna is waiting for us to recognize that. That no, even when you choose, even when you choose to say there's no thread, even when you choose to deny me, even then, I'm there for you. That's Krishna's greatness. That's his mercy, his compassion. That even when the living entity says, you have ah, no God, right? I don't need anyone. I'm the master of everything I survey. Kartaham, Ishwaroham, Maham Bhogi, Siddhoham Balavan Sukhi. This is Krishna describes as the demoniac nature in Bhagavad Gita. Ishwaroham, I am the, the king, uh, I am the Lord, Ishwaro. Aham Bhogi, I am the enjoyer. Siddhoham, I am perfect. Look at my life. It's so beautiful, it's so perfect. I've got everything figured out. <laughs> Balavan, I'm strong. Sukhi, I'm happy. Even when we think like that, I don't need you, Krishna. Even then Krishna says, no, I'll be there in your heart. I'm there to, because I know that you're, you cannot exist without me. So I'm there to help you. That's Krishna's mercy. That's his compassion. And he's there and he's calling to each one of us. He's calling. This is why Krishna plays a flute. Because through the flute, he calls every living entity. He's got a little hook in our heart. And he calls us, he pulls us, he tugs at our heartstrings and he says, come, come back to me, recognize me, I'm right here. I'm in the core of your heart and I'm here in front of you. And he's waiting for us to recognize that call. So Krishna's call, uh, the Acharyas describe, comes in five different ways. Uh, Krishna calls us. He calls us through his devotees, uh, through the association. <coughs> devotees come up to us and they say, Center your life on Krishna. Make yourself Krishna conscious. And that's Krishna's call. It's not just that devotee speaking. It's Krishna speaking through that devotee. And we say, well, maybe I'm busy. Come back another time. <laughs> to, through the devotee, through the Lord's deity form, uh, he calls us. We can look at Krishna's form of beauty and we can see in Krishna's eyes the Lord will reciprocate as the deity. We pray to the deity, we talk to him, we will see, Krishna will speak to us. It's not a piece of stone or metal or anything. It's Krishna there. But he's calling us and we 
nah, God is everywhere, this is just a stone, this is just a rock. And we deny that call. Krishna calls us through his holy names. He's directly present in his holy name. Kali kale naam rupe Krishna avatar. Nam nam akari bahuda nijas sarva shaktis. Krishna is directly present. Abhinnatvat nama naminaha. There is no difference between Krishna and his holy name. Therefore, it's chintamani. It's like a touchstone. So, we should chant Krishna's holy names. He calls us through the name. It's always there for us. Direct contact with Krishna. And yet, no time, no taste, no interest. We have no taste, no desire to do it. We don't listen to that call. But he's there through the devotee, through the deity, through Krishna's holy names, through the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. These books, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna is directly alive and he's speaking through the pages of these books. Maybe you've had this experience if you read Prabhupada's books directly. Uh, regularly, I mean. Uh, otherwise, if you don't, I encourage you to try this. When you're in your time of greatest difficulty, problem, something is really bothering you, just open up Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's amazing. The page you open it up to, Srila Prabhupada, Krishna will be speaking directly in response to your problem. You've had this experience before? Yeah. And many devotees shaking their head. You should try it. I've had many times this experience. Uh, and you're just stunned. So how is this possible? It's possible because these are not dead, these books. They're not just paper. Right? This is alive. Krishna is Purana Brahma Samitam. Srimad Bhagavatam is non-different from Krishna. It is actually Krishna himself. And when we associate with Bhagavatam by reading Srimad Bhagavatam, we are in Krishna's direct presence. Deity, devotee, Nam, Bhagavatam, and finally, Krishna's abode, the Dham. This temple is Krishna's call to all of us. It's a place where we can access all of the other four. We can get the association of devotees. We can see Krishna's deity form. We can hear from the pages of Bhagavad Gita. We can chant Krishna's name together. Right? It's a little embassy of the spiritual world. Prabhupada said, every one of my temples, he said, is an embassy of the spiritual world. It is technically not part of this material world. Just like an embassy is not technically part of the host country. It's part of the, the home country. Right? In this way, this is part of the spiritual world, this temple. So this is Krishna's call. Five times, five different ways, Krishna calls us again and again and again and again. And so our job as pearls on that thread is to maximize the points of contact between us and these five things. Anything we can do in our life to increase our contact with deity, devotee, nam, dham, and Srimad Bhagavatam, it will improve our situation in this world and help us recover our forgotten connection with Krishna. Help the pearls to remember their place on the thread and the role they play in Krishna's beautiful, beautiful necklace. And in that way, maybe one day we too can join in that beautiful necklace. We can join Krishna's party here that you see in this picture of running through the forest of Vrindavan with abandon and with joy. We've got our spot there. Right? We just have to take it up. Thank you all so much for your attention. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.